Good morning. Always a joy to be at Rock of Ages. In fact, I'm feeling more and more at home here at your church. I'm wondering whether I could apply for PR status or not. <laughs> if there's such a thing. Well, as you know, in a few weeks' time, we'll be celebrating Christmas. Wow. In fact, the Christmas spirit is already in the air. As you walk down Orchard Road, you see the lights and some malls already playing uh, Christmas carols. So it's a wonderful time of the year. And of course, we all remember Jesus is the reason for the season. And also in this season, you'll be hearing a number of messages regarding the birth of Jesus Christ. And I trust that your hearts be open to hear what the Lord has for you in this season. Especially the Christmas uh, uh, celebration here, you know, invite your pre-Christian friends. A great opportunity to reach out to our pre-Christian uh, friends. So this morning, I'd like to entitle my message, A Tale of Two Kings. A Tale of Two Kings. We look into the life of one earthly king and one heavenly king. And I'm not talking about Andy Lau. He's one of the four heavenly kings of Kento Pop, all right? I'm talking about uh, King Jesus. So we can look at the life of King Herod and also King Jesus and draw some very important lessons out of the contrast of these two kings. Let us pray. Our Father, as we bow our hearts before your wonderful presence, and as we enter in this, Lord, Christmas season, help us, dear Lord, to, to pause, to ponder, and prostrate our hearts before you, and just to hear what you have to say to us, O oh God. And I pray that in this Christmas season, that you would draw each and every one of us closer and deeper into your wonderful presence. And Lord, we commit this time to you as you look into your precious word, O oh God. Holy Spirit, speak to each and every one of us. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 2. Reading, looking at verses 1 to 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when he rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. We are all very familiar with this uh, passage of scripture, talking about the Magi, you know, who, who heard and saw the star, and they said, we want to go and worship Jesus. And here in verse 3, King Herod also heard about the birth of Jesus, and the Bible says he was disturbed. He was disturbed. And we need to ask ourselves this question, why was King Herod so disturbed about the news of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ? I guess we have to know King Herod to understand why he was disturbed. You see, King Herod was also called Herod the Great, and he ruled for 33 years. He accomplished great things. But King Herod was an evil man, full of himself. And there are three words to describe King Herod. Three words. The first word is conceited. A very, very proud person. That's King Herod. It's all about himself. It's always, it's always about me, I, myself. That's it. King Herod has always been consumed about himself, his self-image, his reputation. It's all about himself. 
In other words, King Herod, he has a big, big ego. Huge ego. Do you know the word ego, E-G-O, what does it stand for? E-G-O stands for aging God out. There's no God in him. It's all about himself. There's that full of ego, aging God out. Because King Herod sees himself as God and no one else. So he was conceited and secondly, also cunning. A very cunning man. You look at the scripture, when he heard about the birth of Jesus, and he knew that Magi will be, you know, going to worship Jesus, what did he tell the Magi? He said, tell me where he is, because I too want to worship him. Wow. I also want to worship Jesus. What a lie. He did not mean what he said. A big lie. A very cunning man, so to speak. Because he would do anything to put himself first. A very cunning person. A schemer who are always, who is fearful of losing his power and position. And the third word to describe King Herod is calculative. That means King Herod, a man, is about what he could get. The way up is to push others out. That is King Herod, basically. So when he heard about the birth of Jesus, fear came upon him. He felt threatened because to him, this King Jesus may be more popular, more famous than him. And people begin to honor King Jesus more than him. That's why he felt threatened. When he came to know that the Magi has outwitted him, you know the scripture, the, an angel appeared to the Magi and told, him, told them, you just go on your way, don't go back to King Herod. So when King Herod knew that the Magi has outwitted him, what did he do? He gave an order that, Children between age two and below should be killed. Because that's the way to eliminate any threat to his throne. So can you imagine the, the evil you know, uh, spirit in, in King Herod? Wow. He killed all the children. And by the way, according to history, he killed two of his wives also. That's King Herod, considered cunning and calculative. And of course, you may say this morning, I am not like King Herod. I don't kill people. I'm not as evil as King Herod. But just the point is this, or the fact is this, at the core of each and every one of us, there's no real difference between King Herod and us. Because in us also there is that self-centeredness. The me, the I, that's always so strong in each and every one of us. Because basically, we are all also very self-centered. Let's look at King Jesus. Jesus came to this world Died at the age of 33, born in a manger, walked on earth, preached the gospel, healed many people, brought the kingdom of God, and those who believe in him will receive salvation and the gift of eternal life, died for each and every one of us, resurrected on the third day, and then ascended up to heaven and now seated at the right hand of the Father. He came and He gave His life for us. 
And there are three words to describe Jesus. The first word is sacrificial. He sacrificed his life for us. Herod shed the blood of others, but Jesus shed his own blood. What a difference. There's a great contrast. Life revolves around sacrificing for others as far as Jesus is concerned. So a very sacrificial person. Then selfless, of course. The king became a servant. In Philippians, became nothing. He gave his all to us. That's why in Mark 10, verse 45, the Bible says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. A selfless person. And the third word is sympathetic. He understands our pain. He understands our challenges. He understands our struggles because of his incarnation to become a man. He walked on this earth. He understands us. A sympathetic person. There's one great difference between King Herod and King Jesus, and that is Herod puts himself first. And the word is selfishness. He lived for himself. Well, Jesus, he puts others first. Selflessness, he lived for others. The big difference between King Herod and King Jesus. And between these two men, we begin to see and understand the pitfalls of selfish living and the power of selfless living. The pitfalls of selfish living and the power of selfless living. So from these two men, and looking at the life of Jesus and the life of King Herod, there are three important lessons for all of us to learn this morning. Three very important lessons. Lesson number one. When your greatness comes first, your greatness will not last. Let me say that again. When your greatness comes first, your greatness will not last. Church, the fact is that the whole trouble with mankind is about the self. Being self-centered and always putting the self first, that is one great, you know, issue facing mankind. And this self-centeredness, this selfiness is mankind is being played out in every realm of life, in the society, in the country, in our, in our family, and even at workplace, and in, even in church at times. That this, this root of self-centeredness have brought tremendous trouble, tremendous pain to so many people because of the issue of self-centeredness. We are all rooted, in one sense, in selfishness. Let me ask you a question. When you take a group photo, and after you receive the photo, you look at it, who's the first person you look at? It's always ourselves, right? That's the fact. Why do you look at yourself? Because we are concerned about me, right? Self-centeredness. There were two hunters out in the jungle hunting for bears and they, be, they took a rest after some time. And they took off their shoes, resting, having a time just to chew out. 
And then suddenly, a bear appeared before them. And one of them immediately put on his shoes. Immediately. And the other, the other hunter asked him, Hey, why do you put on your shoes? You could not outrun the bear. And the, the man said, But I could outrun you. <laughs> the issue of self centeredness But ultimately, church, the last of selfish gain or this uh, issue of self centeredness will destroy us, will harm us in one way or another. Just read the newspapers every day. You see many women getting into trouble because of self-centeredness. Look at the legacy of King Herod. What kind of legacy did he leave behind? A bad reputation, an evil king. That's why I say when your greatness comes first, your greatness will not last. But rather look at the legacy of Jesus Christ. Until today, you know, so many books were reading about him, songs written about him, millions of people worship him. What a great legacy. Because Jesus, he humbled himself, he gave himself for mankind. Where else Herod is always about himself. So I pray we learn these important lessons that we must not put ourselves first. We learn to put God first. Because the point is this, when your greatness comes first, your greatness will not last. This is the first important lesson. The second important lesson is this. The way up is down. The way up is down. But for many people in our society today, the way up is up. All right? The way up is up. That's the path of self exhortation. We exhort ourselves, we promote ourselves. You remember Mrs. Zebedee in the Bible? One day, Mrs. Zebedee came before the Lord Jesus Christ and he he said to the Lord, Lord, I have two sons. Can one of them sit on your right and the other sits on your left? Remember that? Because she wanted her sons to be in, in a position of authority in a position of greatness. But what did Jesus say to her? And finally, Jesus said, if you want to be great, you must be a servant of all. What a great contrast. That the way up is down. That's why many people have this misconception. The way up is to knock everyone down and push oneself up. But Jesus said, if you want to be great, then be a servant first. You see, in our society today, there are a number of philosophies floating around. For example, appetite we all have, have appetite, you know, different kinds of appetite. Appetite says, be sensuous, enjoy yourself. That's what our appetite will tell us. Education says, be resourceful, expand yourself. Humanism says, be capable, believe in yourself. Maturism says, be satisfied, please yourself. Psychology says, be confident, assert yourself. And of course, pride says, be superior, promote yourselves. But what did Jesus say? Be humble, give yourself. 
Be humble, give yourselves. That's why in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, let me just read to you. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He made himself nothing. He became a servant. He humbled himself. The way up is down. It is a paradox. Indeed. That's why D.L. Moody said, the beginning of greatness is to be little. The increase of greatness is to be less. And the perfection of greatness is to be nothing. Is to be nothing. That's the message for us at this Christmas. He must increase and we must decrease. Church, let me just say this. In our lives, we must learn to take the downward escalator. From time to time, it's difficult for us to, be, to humble ourselves and take the downward escalator. To humble ourselves so that Christ may be exalted in our lives. It is never easy to humble ourselves. Never easy to eat humble pies, so to speak. But when we do it in the right spirit, that's where we experience the grace of God even much more in our lives. I remember there was one time a member was not happy with me because he disagreed with the decision that I made. And he outright expressed his unhappiness. When he comes to church on Sunday, when I reach out my hand to shake his hand, he refused to shake my hand. Wow, it hurts. I remember one time you went, when, as I was preaching, he just walked out of the service. He was so unhappy with me. What do you do with such a person? How do you respond, you know, to such uh, a challenging uh, situation, so to speak? And by the grace of God, I said, God, you help me. In my own flesh, I will just want to ignore him. I did nothing wrong. I can just ignore him. But I say, God, by your grace and by your strength, help me to reach out to him. And I always make the point, whenever I see him, I will call his name. I will reach out my hand, whether he shakes my hand or not. To me, it will not bother me. And also, when I heard that his father passed away, I make it a point to go down to the wake. All right, to extend my condolences to him. In other words, I will always make a point to just reach out to him, to reach out to him and to reach out to him. In other words, I kept on eating humble pie. Quite delicious. Huh? I just kept on humbling ourselves to reach out to him. I want you to know this. Today, this brother, whenever he sees me, he will hug me. Really. The Lord just brought, you know, the healing in him. The Lord just, you know, brought the walls down. And somehow God just brought about a breakthrough. And as I say, whenever he sees me, he will hug me. Well, thank God for such an outcome. Because I learned to take the downward escalator. So in your life from time to time, 
there will be situations that you have to make a decision, and that is to humble yourself or not. And I want to say to you, ask the Lord for strength. Ask the Lord for grace to, to come upon you, to enable you to do what you could not do in your own human strength, but to do, do it for God, because the way up is down. And when we humble ourselves, the Lord will exalt us. The Lord will exalt us. So we just trust the Lord and say, God, I'll do what I should do, even though I don't want to do it. But Lord, in your strength, by your grace, I will do it. So with such humility and obedience in our hearts, that's where you and I will experience more of God in our lives. Take the downward escalator. Learn from our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me also say this. All of us here, we are people of influence in one way or another. But some of us here, we have been placed in a position of greater influence. You understand what I'm saying? Some of us, we are placed in a position of greater influence, where you're in a position of authority, a position where you are greatly respected, where you have your titles, you know, and uh, accolades given to you. Some of us have been blessed in such a manner. But let me say this. The more the Lord place you in a position of influence, the more you ask the Lord to help you to humble yourself. Because at that position, when you learn to humble yourself, that's where you can make even greater influence on the people around you. You can make greater impact to the people around you. So to me, don't miss such wonderful opportunities that God has given to us. I always say to myself and remind myself from time to time, and I say, Lord, help me that I will not allow my position or the power that I have to get into my head. But rather, to allow your blessings upon my lives to further strengthen my heart. Never allow the achievements and the accolades to get into our heads. And church, the fact is that it is so easy when we are up somewhere, when we are experiencing success and great blessings, and the danger is that we allow pride to creep in. And we begin to, you know, allow the cells to grow even bigger. That is the great danger. That's why the more the Lord, you know, exhorts you, the more you must determine to humble yourself. Because when you do that, that's where that you will be a greater influence and greater impact to the people around you. This way, the way up is down. So I'm exhorting you, fellow brothers and sisters, the Lord has blessed you in different ways. God has put many of you in position of greatness and position and, and influence. Let Christ be exalted in your life. Amen. Let Christ be lifted up by the way you live your life, by the way you conduct yourselves. Thank God for the position. Thank God for the power. Thank God for the achievement. Thank God for the accolade. Thank God for the titles. Thank God. But all these are blessings of the Lord that comes, that comes upon us, not for us to lift ourselves up, but for us to use it as a push to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, that He alone will be exalted. A very important lesson to remind ourselves, it is not easy, I can tell you, but it is so important. Because at times I see Christians, 
when they go into a restaurant, for example, when the service is a bit slow, or when things are not being done according to their ways or preference, they express their unhappiness straight away. And some of you begin to demand, you know, better services. I'm not saying that, you know, we should tolerate uh, poor services. I'm addressing the whole issue of our attitude in a relationship, the way we relate with people. That we must always humble ourselves. And then we reach out. Because in such a manner, like I say, that's where we lift up the name of our Lord. The way up is down. A very important second lesson. The third lesson is this. To live well is to live largely. To live well is to live largely. King Herod, he lived for himself. But Jesus Christ came and he lived for others. A greater purpose, a greater mission in the life of Jesus Christ. He lived his life largely for others. In the same way, you and I, there is something we must be determined to live largely. That means to embrace a purpose bigger than us. To embark on a mission bigger than us. And that is so, so important because it's so easy for us to live for ourselves. But God is calling us in this Christmas season, look at the life of Jesus Christ. He lived for others. In the same way, we must begin to learn to live a life that will fulfill God's ultimate purpose. You and I, we have choices, really. You can either live your life selfishly or sacrificially. That's a choice. You can live your life foolishly or fully for God. You can live your life pointlessly or purposely or purposefully for God. It all depends on us. But my prayer is that in this Christmas season, as we are reminded of what Christ has done, that He came for us, that it's time for us to say, God, help me to live this life for you to live largely for you and for your glory. Because lasting legacy is created through self-sacrifice and servanthood and a determination to live purposefully. So the question to you is, who are you living for? And how are you living your life? Live largely. Just yesterday, Carrie and I, we were watching uh, the YouTube on uh, what the channel? America Got Talent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and they were showing the top three uh, golden uh, buses, you know. And I was watching and uh, seeing, you know, different ones coming up to perform and hearing their stories. And, uh, you know, somehow tears just flow from my eyes. Because they show once again, you know, uh, Nightbird, you know, the lady who now passed away. And as I watched the three top, you know, people who won, and I, I was just reminded once again that we are here not for ourselves, for others. Because as I watch, all these people, they are being encouraged. They, they receive great encouragement. And I say to, to Caris, I, I want to you know, find a ministry 
yes, I'm doing ministry now. Is there something that for the rest of my life, whatever I do, I can put a smile on the faces of people? I can give them a word of encouragement. I can lift them up. You know, I can give them a sense of hope. A greater sense of hopefulness in their lives, and you know, to just to just pour my life out so that others may be be lifted up and be encouraged. Because I'm reminded once again, I've only one life, really, and this life is is short. And how much more years I have, and I want to live the rest of my life to the best of my ability for God to live fully for Him. That Christ may be exalted, and more lives may come to know Him as Savior and and Lord. So I want to challenge you at this Christmas season that you find a purpose, you find a mission, all right, and serve the Lord in the church, and do whatever you can to allow your life to be ex. Expanded in such a way that you are able to impact and influence more people for His glory, to live largely, and more so. The more the Lord bless you, the more you must determine to give more and more as the Lord continue to bless your life more and more. And that is so needful. So these are three. Important lessons for all of us. When your greatness comes first, your greatness will not last. Second, the way up is down, and third, to live well is to live largely. So our response to in this Christmas forwards. First word is reflect. Let's take time to reflect on the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's reflect on why Jesus came, why He was born in a manger. Take time to reflect, and second, to repent, to repent of our selfishness, our self-centeredness. At times, we are so proud, so conceited. We need to repent, and some of us we always want to do things our way. But let's repent and say, God, I want to do things Your way, not my way. And then to receive, to receive the forgiveness, to receive the blessings, to receive what God has for us in this Christmas. He came that we have life and life more abundantly. There's so much more that we can receive from the Lord. It is time to receive, and most of all, it's time to rededicate, to rededicate your life to the Lord and to live for Him and to make your life count for eternity for Him. So Christmas is a wonderful time, a time of great celebration. A time of you know, just enjoying the blessings of the Lord, and most of all, it's a time for us to say, "God, more of You in my life and less of me." Reflect, repent, receive, and rededicate. And I pray that you and I, in this Christmas season, they will draw ourselves closer to the Lord. And say, God, just more of you in my life. Let us pray.